My name is Kathleen Penry. I'm a solitary pagan witch. I'm an author and the founder of the Wolf and Howl Press. And today's little chat is another in the series about the Anglo-Saxon runes. Um, and this is about the second rune in the rune poem called Ur. And it looks like that. I'm, I'm looking a bit dazed because I've had to draw it back to front so it looks right when you look at it. Anyway, there we go. So, this is another one. Now, it's usually thought to mean the aurochs. The ur is the aurochs. Um, and it was an ancient animal, huge thing, six foot up to the shoulders and its horns were six foot across. They often used them as great big drinking horns for feasting, you know, they'd hold about a gallon of mead or something. Um, but they were extinct in England by the time the Anglo-Saxon and Germanic tribes arrived although they did remain on continental Europe till about the 17th century. So given there was trade and exchange between the British Isles and continental Europe, obviously they were still going to know about them. But why it turned up in the Anglo-Saxon rune poem, well, that's anybody's guess, but let's have a look at it. Ur bith anmod and overhorned. The aurochs is bold and overhorned. Come back to that bit in a minute. Fella fretne de ophioteth mid hornum. A very savage, wild animal that fights with horns. Mara morstapa. That is modic wood. The famous traverser of the moors, a headstrong creature. Now, we have to admit there's been an awful lot of different translations of this one. Nobody has quite agreed on it, but still we're doing our best. Uh, this is why I had to translate the rune poem again for myself because I thought I had looked at about six, seven, eight different versions and really studied them and I realised they're all so different from each other. There has to be an underlying truth. We have to try and get at it. And as I said, you know, part of the thing with the early translations was that they were academics, they were male, they were Christian usually. Um, and they would translate things in a certain way that fitted the way they saw the world at the time. It doesn't make them more right or less right than me. It just means they had a different outlook and therefore the, the rune poem spoke to them in a different way. Anyway, let's try that again. The aurochs is bold and overhorned, a very savage wild animal that fights with horns, the famous traverser of the moors, a headstrong creature. And uh, there are all sorts of things, little layers that we can peel back. The Anglo-Saxons had something they called kennings and a kenning is a word that stands for something else. Uh, so you might say man but you don't mean that kind of man. That was what we found in the previous one where Fira meant a man who was on a lower level. He wasn't fully enlightened. He was sentient but he wasn't completely spiritual. So this one is quite different. This one goes straight into the world of animals and an extinct animal at that, which suggests that perhaps it was written long before the Anglo-Saxon tribes left continental Europe and sailed to Britain. Um, it's a wild ox. Let me have a little look through because I don't remember it all, what I've written. Um, so I think that the reason it's gone the way it has is because if he was a spiritual speaker, a seeker, oh crumbs, spiritual seeker, we're having a bad day today, um, of any persuasion, it doesn't matter what religion it is, you do expect to confront various challenges. Sometimes you, you confront threatening entities or situations during the course of your journey. I mean, you know, the early saints did. They, they confronted dragons and strange creatures and had to do battle with them. Um, so we know that the aurochs actually lived in forests, so that the traverser of the moors isn't quite accurate in that sense. Um, they were, you know, they were definitely overhorned. It's a good example of it, a good thing, what you can say for it. Um, but we don't know whether they were actually fierce. I mean, they might have been very gentle creatures for all we know. You know, sometimes big animals can be very nice. But they were fierce looking and they certainly were frightening and you think of them coming up out of the mists of the moors and that's like something out of nightmare isn't it that's that's coming up to confront you and um the other thing of course the horns 
there was evidence of a stag cult in northern Europe, um, a very ancient stag cult. And we know that, uh, oh, I'll read it to you now. Aldhelm of Malsbury, sometimes called Aldhelm of Sherborne, they're not far away from each other, uh, wrote a letter in the 680s, which is very early, and that's just after the church claimed that they'd made everyone a Christian, which wasn't entirely true. They hadn't, uh, but they said they had. Um, and what Aldhelm wrote was, let us raise a hymn where, that where once the crude pillars of the same foul snake and the stag were worshipped. Now that's interesting, isn't it? You know, you have the stag, the great horned creature. And the second verse is the aurochs, who is overhorned. And I think that's quite, that's quite interesting, you know, because the other part that's interesting, you might think to yourself, well, it was Christian clerics who wrote this, this rune poem down because it would only have been remembered orally the the Germanic tribes didn't really go in a lot for writing they didn't see any need for it and if you were, are in an orally based society then you you your memory becomes quite fantastic and you really do you know you can remember huge lengths of things I mean I find now I can remember poetry I learned when I was a child um, can't remember where I put the keys but you know stuff like that anyway the other thing that's interesting, you might think, well, if it was Christian clerics who were the ones who could write, who wrote this down, uh, how come they didn't get rid of all these references to uh, things that were pagan or heathen? Well, it might have been that they were told, look, write it down. It's a good exercise. We, we will write it down and bear it in mind. Um, one translator said, oh, it was only meant to be like A is for apple, B is for ball, things like that. It was like a nursery rhyme which is rubbish. I mean, once you come across that, you think, no, I'm not listening to anything else you've got to say. You're so far of the, off the mark. But Christians actually identified themselves with stags. So that's another reason this could have passed under the radar. Um, they, they, did, um, they did believe, you know, um, as the heart, which is another word for a stag, as the heart that panteth after the fountains of water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. So... To have a stag in a in a poem or a horned creature is not that bad. It wasn't really going to be something that offended them. Um, and also, of course, the idea that um, there's an Anglo-Saxon poem uh, called Solomon and Saturn, number two. Uh, and, and it's a religious poem, but he said that the poet said that hell contained many a poisonous beast with iron horns. So you see, you would get round it that way by saying, oh, well, that's what it's showing. It's showing the overhorned creature, you know. The other thing that's quite interesting is how far it links up to uh, Wayland Smith. Now, we know Wayland Smith was a sort of godlike um, character in Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition. Um, he was a blacksmith, one of the Smith gods. And there are a lot of similarities between him and people like Hephaestus in ancient Greece. I'm sorry about all this groaning. It's not Mr. Penry, honestly. Uh, it's the dogs. They're making all sorts of strange noises. So please bear with me. But anyway, Wayland, um, his mother was, um, his grandmother rather, was a sea giantess. And his father was the giant Wade, W-A-D-E. And Wade is often associated with the sea. And um, Wayland's son, Widia, was also associated with the sea. But <clears throat> what links them all around with this aurochs, which is quite interesting to find an Anglo-Saxon character who is able, we can link him up, is that an 18th century history of Whit Whitby um, claimed that local people possessed a huge bone, which they said was the one of the ribs of Bell Wade's cow. Uh, so now we have um, this great horned creature that belonged to the giant Wade and his wife. And the giant Wade was the father of Wayland Smith. That's quite interesting. Wayland's, Wayland's mother was supposed to have walked a great distance across the moors. So now we've reached the moors in order to uh, milk an enormous cow, another horned creature. Um, and in order to make the journey easier, Wade, who was Wayland's father, built this huge causeway, which was known, and I think it still is, it's known as Wade's Causey. 
Of course, it's much, much older than the Anglo-Saxons. It's a very, very ancient causeway. Who knows who built it, you know. But it does suggest that the Anglo-Saxons, when they came over, they adopted it and they fitted it into their own legend somehow. Now, it might be they adopted the legend as well. We don't know. They could have done. Wayland and Wade and all this, it might well have been some legend that pre-existed before the Anglo-Saxons came, but it's certainly associated with them. We know that through the poetry. But I think that the purpose of this particular verse is to warn the spiritual seeker, it's not going to be all plain sailing. You will meet challenges. You will meet entities and people that you really <coughs> have to challenge. You have to get past them. They will stop you if they can. You know, so it might also be warning us against admiring the wrong sort of strength now that's another one very much a thing for our times how far we admire those who are cruel or unkind or lack <coughs> compassion oh they're the ones they're they're the ones who tell it like it is no they're not they're horrible just stop there stop it horrible and leave them be get on with it um and of course the you know another possibility is that this huge creature is an unexpected ally you know we've got to think of that and in my book, I go I go through it much more detail, which I can't hear. I've reached 11 and a half minutes now, and I haven't even touched on it, really. But, um, you know, he, he was always... The aurochs was always a huge creature. You could fear him. There's no mention of him being loved or liked or domesticated. He's not. He's wild. He's unpredictable. Things that were wild were very unpredictable. So I'm going to leave it there because I've come up to 12 minutes. If you'd like some more on the subject, fine. Or if you've got a specific question, please just put it in the comments below. Um, and uh, if you wish, please, you know, subscribe so you're always notified of more. And uh, you should. I think there's a notifications bell somewhere. You've got to click and then they'll tell you when the next video comes up. I am doing my best to do them regularly, but I've been in hospital, which rather slowed things up a bit. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.